Section 15 of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Blackjack Bargainer. The most disreputable thing in Yancey Gorey's law office was Gorey himself, sprawled in his creaky old armchair. The rickety little office, built of red brick, was set flush with the street, the main street of the town of Bethel. Bethel rested upon the foothills of the Blue Ridge. Above it the mountains were piled to the sky. Far below it the turbid Catawba gleamed yellow along its disconsolate valley. The June day was at its sultriest hour. Bethel dozed in the tepid shade. Trade was not. It was so still that Gorey, reclining in his chair, distinctly heard the clicking of the chips in the grand jury room where the courthouse gang was playing poker. From the open back door of the office, a well-worn path meandered across the grassy lot to the courthouse. The treading out of that path had cost Gorey all he ever had, first inheritance of a few thousand dollars, next the old family home, and latterly the last shreds of his self-respect and manhood. The gang had cleaned him out. The broken gambler had turned drunkard and parasite. He had lived to see this day come when the men who had stripped him denied him a seat at the game. His word was no longer to be taken. The daily bouts at cards had arranged itself accordingly, and to him was assigned the ignoble part of the onlooker, the sheriff, the county clerk, a sportive deputy, a gay attorney, and a chalk-faced man hailing from the valley sat at the table, and the sheared one was thus tacitly advised to go and grow more wool. Soon worrying of his ostracism, Gorey had departed for his office, muttering to himself as he unsteadily traversed the unlucky pathway. After a drink of corn whiskey from a demijohn under the table, he had flung himself into the chair, staring in a sort of maudlin apathy out at the mountains immersed in the summer haze. The little white patch he saw away up on the side of Blackjack was Laurel, the village near which he had been born and bred. There also was the birthplace of the feud between the Gorys and the coal trains. Now no direct heir of the Gorys survived except this plucked and singed bird of misfortune. To the coal trains also, but one male supporter was left. Colonel Abner Coltrane, a man of substance and standing, a member of the state legislature, and a contemporary with Gorey's father. The feud had been a typical one of the region. It had left a red record of hate, wrong, and slaughter. But Yancey Gorey was not thinking of feuds. His befuddled brain was hopelessly attacking the problem of the future maintenance of himself and his favorite follies. Of late, old friends of the family had seen to it that he had whereof to eat and a place to sleep, but whiskey they would not buy for him and he must have whiskey. His law business was extinct. No case had been entrusted to him for two years. He had been a borrower and a sponge, and it seemed that if he fell no lower, it would be from lack of opportunity. One more chance, he was saying to himself. If he had one more stake at the game, he thought he could win, but he had nothing left to sell, and his credit was more than exhausted. He could not help smiling even in his misery, as he thought of the man to whom, six months before, he had sold the old gory homestead. There had come from back yarn and the mountains two of the strangest creatures, a man named Pike Garvey and his wife. Back yon, with a wave of the hand toward the hills, was understood among the mountaineers to designate the remotest fastness, the unplumbed gorges, the haunts of lawbreakers, the wolf's den, and the boudoir of the bear, in the cabin, far up on Blackjack's shoulder, in the wildest parts of these retreats, this odd couple had lived for twenty years. They had neither dog nor children to mitigate the heavy silence of the hills. Pike Garvey was little known in the settlement, but all who had dealt with him had pronounced him crazy as a loon. He acknowledged no occupation save that of squirrel hunter, but he moonshined occasionally by way of diversion. Once, the revenues had dragged him from his lair, fighting silently and desperately like a terrier, 
and he had been sent to state prison for two years. Released, he popped back into his hole like an angry weasel. Fortune, passing over many anxious wooers, made a freakish flight into Blackjack's bosky pockets to smile upon Pike and his faithful partner. One day a party of spectacled, knickerbockered, and altogether absurd prospectors invaded the vicinity of Garvey's cabin. Pike lifted his squirrel rifle off the hooks and took a shot at them at long range on the chance of their being revenues. Happily he missed, and the unconscious agents of good luck drew nearer, disclosing their innocence of anything resembling law or justice. Later on, they offered the Garveys an enormous quantity of ready, green, crisp money for their thirty-acre patch of cleared land, mentioning, as an excuse for such a mad action, some irrelevant and inadequate nonsense about a bed of mica underlying the said property. When the Garveys became possessed of so many dollars that they faltered in computing them, the deficiencies of life on Blackjack began to grow prominent. Pike began to talk of new shoes, a hogshead of tobacco to set in the corner, a new lock to his rifle, and leading Martella to a certain spot on the mountainside, he pointed out to her how a small cannon, doubtless a thing not beyond the scope of their fortune in price, might be planted so as to command and defend the sole accessible trail to the cabin, to the confusion of revenues and meddling strangers forever. But Adam reckoned without his eve. These things represented to him the applied power of wealth, but there slumbered in his dingy cabin an ambition that soared far above his primitive wants. Somewhere in Mrs. Garvey's bosom still survived a spot of femininity, unstarved by twenty years of blackjack. For so long a time the sounds in her ears had been the scaly barks dropping in the woods at noon, and the wolves singing among the rocks at night and it was enough to have purged her of vanities. She had grown fat and sad and yellow and dull. But when the means came, she felt a rekindled desire to assume the prerequisites of her sex, to sit at tea-tables, to buy futile things, to whitewash the hideous veracity of life with a little form and ceremony. She coldly vetoed Pike's proposed system of fortifications and announced that they would descend upon the world and gyrate socially and thus at length it was decided, and the thing done. The village of Laurel was their compromise between Mrs. Garvey's preference for one of the large valley towns and Pike's hankering for primeval solitudes. Laurel yielded a halting round of feeble social distractions, comportable with Martella's ambitions, and was not entirely without recommendation to Pike. Its contiguity to the mountains presenting advantages for sudden retreat in case fashionable society should make it advisable. Their descent upon Laurel had been coincident with Yancey Gorey's feverish desire to convert property into cash, and they bought the old Gorey homestead, paying $4,000 ready money into the spendthrift's shaking hands. Thus it happened that while the disreputable last of the Goreys sprawled in his disreputable office at the end of his row, Spurned by the cronies whom he had gorged, strangers dwelt in the halls of his fathers. A cloud of dust was rolling slowly up the parched street, with something traveling in the midst of it. A little breeze wafted the cloud to one side, and a new, brightly painted carryall, drawn by a slothful gray horse, became visible. The vehicle deflected from the middle of the street as it neared Gorey's office and stopped in the gutter directly in front of his door. On the front seat sat a gaunt tall man, dressed in black broadcloth, his rigid hands incarcerated in yellow kid gloves. On the back seat was a lady who triumphed over the June heat. Her stout form was armored in a skin-tight silk dress of the description known as changeable, being a gorgeous combination of shifting hues. She sat erect, waving a much-ornamented fan, with her eyes fixed stonily far down the street. However, Martella Garvey's heart might be rejoicing at the pleasures of her new life. Black Jack had done his work with her exterior. He had carved her countenance to the image 
of emptiness and inanity, and had imbued her with the stolidity of his crags and the reserve of his hushed interiors. She always seemed to hear, whatever her surroundings were, the scaly barks falling and pattering down the mountainside. She could always hear the awful silence of Blackjack sounding through the stillest of nights. Gorey watched the solemn equipage as it drove to his door, with only faint interest, but when the lank driver wrapped the reins about his whip, awkwardly descended, and stepped into the office, he rose unsteadily to receive him, recognizing Pike Garvey, the new, the transformed, the recently civilized. The mountaineer took the chair Gorey offered him. They who cast doubts upon Garvey's soundness of mind had a strong witness to the man's countenance. His face was too long, a dull saffron in hue, and immobile as a statue's. Pale blue, unwinking round eyes, without lashes, added to the singularity of his gruesome visage. Gorey was at a loss to account for the visit. "'Everything all right at Laurel, Mr. Garvey?' he inquired. "'Everything all right, sir, and mighty pleased is Mrs. Garvey and me with the property. Mrs. Garvey likes your old place, and she likes the neighborhood. Society is what she allows she wants, and she's getting of it. The Rogers, the Hapgoods, the Pratts, and the Troys have been to see Mrs. Garvey, and she is at meals at most of their houses. The best folks have asked her to different kinds of doings. I can't say, Mr. Gorey, that such things suit me. For me, give me that there. Garvey's huge, yellow-gloved hand flourished in the direction of the mountains. That's where I belong, amongst the wild honeybees and the bears. But that ain't what I come for, to say, Mr. Gorey. There's something you got what me and Mrs. Garvey wants to buy. Buy, echoed Gorey, from me. Then he laughed harshly. I reckon you are mistaken about that. I reckon you are mistaken about that. I sold out to you, as you yourself expressed it, lock, stock, and barrel. There isn't even a ramrod left to sell. You got it, and we uns want it. Take the money, says Mrs. Garvey, and buy it fair and square. Gorey shook his head. The cupboard's bare, he said. We've rised, pursued the mountaineer, undeflected from his object, a heap. We was poor as possums, and now we could have folks to dinner every day. We've been recognized, Mrs. Garvey says, by the best society. But there's something we need we ain't got. She says it ought to been put in the inventory of the sale, but it ain't there. Take the money, then, she says, and buy it fair and square. Out with it, said Gorey, his racked nerves growing impatient. Garvey threw a slouch hat upon the table and leaned forward, fixing his unblinking eyes upon Gorey's. There's an old feud, he said distinctly and slowly, between Ewan's and the coal trains. Gorey frowned ominously. To speak of his feud to a feudalist is a serious breach of the mountain etiquette. The man from back yarn knew it as well as the lawyer did. No offense, he went on, but purely in the way of business. Mrs. Garvey have studied all about feuds. Most of the quality folks in the mountains have them. The Settles and the Goforths, the Rankins and the Boyds, the Silers and the Galloways have all been carrying on feuds for twenty to a hundred years. The last man to drop was when your uncle, Judge Paisley Gorey, journeyed out and shot Len Coltrane from the bench. Mrs. Garvey and me, we come from the poor white trash. Nobody would pick a feud with we uns, no more than with a family of tree toads. Quality people everywhere, says Miss Garvey, has feuds. We uns ain't quality, but we're buying into it as fur as we can. Take the money, then, said Mrs. Garvey, and buy Mr. Gorey's feud fair and square. The squirrel hunter straightened a leg half across the room, drew a roll of bills from his pocket, and threw them on the table. There's two hundred dollars, Mr. Gorey, what you would call a fair price for a feud that's been allowed to run down like yours have. There's only you left to carry on your side of it, and you'd make mighty poor killing. I'll take it off your hands, and it'll set me and Mrs. Garvey up among the quality. There's the money. 
the little roll of currency on the table slowly untwisted itself, writhing and jumping as its folds relaxed. In the silence that followed Garvey's last speech, the rattling of the poker chips in the courthouse could be plainly heard. Gorey knew the sheriff had just won a pot, for the subdued whoop which he always greeted a victory floated across the square upon the crinkly heat waves. Beads of moisture stood on Gorey's brow. Stooping, he drew the wicker-covered demijohn from under the table and filled a tumbler from it. A little corn liquor, Mr. Garvey. Of course you're joking about what you spoke of. Opens quite a new market, doesn't it? Feuds. Prime. Two fifty to three. Feuds slightly damaged. Two hundred. I believe you said, Mr. Garvey. Gorey laughed self-consciously. The mountaineer took the glass Gorey handed him and drank the whiskey without a tremor of the lids of his staring eyes. The lawyer applauded the feat by a look of envious admiration. He poured his own drink and took it like a drunkard by gulps and with shudders at the smell and taste. Two hundred, repeated Garvey. There's the money. A sudden passion flared up in Gorey's brain. He struck the table with his fist. One of the bills flipped over and touched his hand. He flinched as if something had stung him. Do you come to me, he shouted seriously, with such a ridiculous, insulting, darn fool proposition? It's fair and square, said the squirrel hunter, but he reached out his hand as if to take back the money, and then Gorey knew that his own flurry of rage had not been from pride or resentment, but from anger at himself, knowing that he would set foot in the deeper depths that were being opened to him. He turned in an instant from an outraged gentleman to an anxious chafer recommending his goods. "'Don't be in a hurry, Garvey,' he said, his face crimson and his speech thick. "'I accept your proposition, though it's dirt cheap at two hundred. A trade's all right when both purchaser and buyer are satisfied. Shall I wrap it up for you, Mr. Garvey?' Garvey rose and shook out his broadcloth. "'Mrs. Garvey will be pleased. You are out of it, and it stands Coltrane and Garvey.' Just a scrap of writing, Mr. Gorey, you being a lawyer, to show we trade it. Gorey seized a sheet of paper and a pen. The money was clutched in his moist hand. Everything else suddenly seemed to grow trivial and light. Bill of sale by all means. Write title and interest in and to forever warrant and... No, Garvey, we'll have to leave out that defend, said Gorey with a loud laugh. You'll have to defend this title yourself. The mountaineer received the amazing screed that the lawyer handed him, folded it with immense labor, and laced it carefully in his pocket. Gorey was standing near the window. Step here, he said, raising his finger, and I'll show you your recently purchased enemy. There he goes, down the other side of the street. The mountaineer crooked his long frame to look through the window in the direction indicated by the other. Colonel Abner Coltrane, an erect, portly gentleman of about fifty, wearing the inevitable long, double-breasted frock coat of the southern lawmaker, and an old high silk hat, was passing on the opposite sidewalk. As Garvey looked, Gorey glanced at his face. If there be such a thing as a yellow wolf, here was its counterpart. Garvey snarled as his unhuman eyes followed the moving figure disclosing long, amber-colored fangs. Is that him? Why, that's the man who sent me to the penitentiary once. He used to be district attorney, said Gorey carelessly, and, by the way, he's a first-class shot. I can hit a squirrel's eye at a hundred yards, said Garvey, so that thar's Coltrane. I made a better trade than I was thinking. I'll take care of this feud, Mr. Gorey, better than you did. He moved toward the door, but lingered there, betraying a slight perplexity. "'Anything else today?' inquired Gorey, with frothy sarcasm. "'Any family traditions, ancestral ghosts, or skeletons in the closet? Prices as low as the lowest.' "'There was another thing,' replied the unmoved squirrel hunter, "'that Mrs. Garvey was thinking of. "'Tain't so much in my line as the other, "'but she wanted particular that I should inquire as if you was willing to pay for it, she says, fair and square. There's a burying ground, as you know, Mr. Gorey, 
in the yard of your old place under the cedars. Them that lies there is your folks that was killed by the coal trains. The monuments has names on them. Mrs. Garvey says a family burying ground is a sure sign of quality. She says if we get the feud, there's something else that ought to go with it. The names on them monuments is gory, but they can be changed to ours by... Go, go, screamed Glory, his face turning purple. He stretched out both hands toward the mountaineer, his fingers hooked and shaking. Go, you ghoul. Even a Chinaman protects the graves of his ancestors. Go. The squirrel hunter slouched out of the door to his carryall. While he was climbing over the wheel, Gory was collecting, with feverish celerity, the money that had fallen from his hand to the floor. As the vehicle slowly turned about, the sheep, with a coat of newly grown wool, was hurrying, in indecent haste, along the path to the courthouse. At three o'clock in the morning they brought him back to his office, shorn and unconscious. The sheriff, the sportive deputy, the county clerk, and the gay attorney carried him, the chalk-faced man from the valley acting as escort. On the table, said one of them, and they deposited him there, among the litter of his unprofitable books and papers. Yancey thinks a lot of a pair of deuces when he's liquored up, sighed the sheriff reflectively. Too much, said the gay attorney. A man has no business to play poker who drinks as much as he does. I wonder how much he dropped tonight. Close to two hundred. What I wonder is where he got it. Yance ain't had a cent for over a month, I know. Struck a client, maybe. Well, let's get home before daylight. He'll be all right when he wakes up, except for a sort of beehive about the cranium. The gang slipped away through the early morning twilight. The next eye to gaze upon the miserable gory was the orb of the day. He peered through the uncurtained window, first deluging the sleeper in a flood of faint gold, but soon pouring upon the mottled red of his flesh a searching white summer heat. Gory stirred, half unconsciously, among the table's debris, and turned his face from the window. His movement dislodged a heavy law book which crashed upon the floor. Opening his eyes, he saw, bending over him, a man in a black frock coat. Looking higher, he discovered a well-worn silk hat, and beneath it the kindly smooth face of Colonel Abner Coltrane. A little uncertain of the outcome, the Colonel waited for the other to make some sign of recognition. Not in twenty years had male members of these two families faced each other in peace. Gory's eyelids puckered, as he strained his blurred eyesight toward this visitor, and then he smiled serenely. "'Have you brought Stella and Lucy over to play?' he said calmly. "'Do you know me, Yancey?' asked Coltrane. "'Of course I do. You brought me a whip with a whistle in the end.' So he had, twenty-four years ago, when Yancey's father was his best friend. Gory's eyes wandered about the room. The colonel understood. "'Lie still, and I'll bring you some,' said he. There was a pump in the yard at the rear, and Gory closed his eyes, listening with rapture to the click of its handle and the bubbling of the fall-in stream. Coltrane brought a pitcher of the cool water and held it for him to drink. Presently Gory sat up, a most forlorn object, his summer suit of flax soiled and crumpled, his discreditable head tousled and unsteady. He tried to wave one of his hands toward the colonel. "'Excuse everything, will you?' he said. "'I must have drunk too much whiskey last night and gone to bed on the table.' His brows knitted into a puzzled frown. "'Out with the boys a while?' asked Coltrane kindly. "'No, I went nowhere. I haven't had a dollar to spend in the last two months. Struck the demijohn too often, I reckon, as usual.' Colonel Coltrane touched him on the shoulder. A little while ago, Yancey, he began, you asked me if I had brought Stella and Lucy over to play. You weren't quite awake then, and must have been dreaming you were a boy again. You are awake now, and I want you to listen to me. I have come from Stella and Lucy to their old playmate, and to my old friend's son. They know that I am going to bring you home with me, and you will find them as ready with a welcome as they were in the old days. I want you to come to my house and stay until you are yourself again, and as much longer as you will. 
We heard of you being down in the world and in the midst of temptation, and we agreed that you should come over and play at our house once more. Will you come, my boy? Will you drop our old family trouble and come with me? Trouble, said Gorey, opening his eyes wide. There was never any trouble between us that I know of. I'm sure we've always been the best of friends. But good Lord, Colonel, how could I go to your house as I am? A drunken wretch, a miserable, degraded spendthrift and gambler. He lurched from the table into his armchair and began to weep maudlin tears, mingled with genuine drops of remorse and shame. Coltrane talked to him persistently and reasonably, reminding him of the simple mountain pleasures of which he had once been so fond, and insisting upon the genuineness of the invitation. Finally he landed Gorey by telling him that he was counting upon his help in the engineering and transportation of a large amount of felled timber from a high mountainside to a waterway. He knew that Gorey had once invented a device for this purpose, a series of slides and chutes upon which he had justly prided himself. In an instant, the poor fellow, delighted at the idea of his being of use to anyone, had paper spread upon the table and was drawing rapid but pitifully shaking lines in demonstration of what he could and would do. The man was sickened of the husks. His prodigal heart was turning again toward the mountains. His mind was yet strangely clogged, and his thoughts and memories were returning to his brain one by one, like carrier pigeons over a stormy sea. But Coltrane was satisfied with the progress he had made. Bethel received the surprise of its existence that afternoon when a Coltrane and a Gorey rode amicably together through the town. Side by side they rode, out from the dusty streets and gaping townspeople, down across the creek bridge and up toward the mountain. The prodigal had brushed and washed and combed himself to a more decent figure, but he was unsteady in the saddle, and he seemed to be deep in the contemplation of some vexing problem. Coltrane left him in his mood, relying upon the influence of changed surroundings to restore his equilibrium. Once Gorey was seized with a shaking fit and almost came to a collapse. He had to dismount and rest at the side of the road. The colonel, foreseeing such a condition, had provided a small flask of whiskey for the journey. But when it was offered to him, Gorey refused it almost with violence, declaring that he would never touch it again. By and by he was recovered and went quietly enough for a mile or two. Then he pulled up his horse suddenly and said, I lost two hundred dollars last night playing poker. Now, where did I get that money? Take it easy, Yancey. The mountain air will soon clear it up. We'll go fishing, first thing, at Pinnacle Falls. The trout are jumping there like bullfrogs. We'll take Stella and Lucy along and have a picnic on Eagle Rock. Have you forgotten how a hickory cured ham sandwich tastes? Yancey to a hungry fisherman. Evidently the colonel did not believe the story of his lost wealth, so Gorey retired again into brooding silence. By late afternoon they had traveled ten of the twelve miles between Bethel and Laurel. Half a mile this side of Laurel lay the old Gorey place. A mile or two beyond the village lived the coal trains. The road was now steep and laborious, but the compensations were many. The tilted aisles of the forest were opulent, with leaf and bird and bloom. The tonic air put to shame the pharmacopoeia. The glades were dark with mossy shade, and bright with shy rivulets winking from the ferns and laurels. On the lower side, they viewed, framed in the near foliage, exquisite sketches of the far valley swooning in its opal haze. Coltrane was pleased to see that his companion was yielding to the spell of the hills and woods for now they had but to skirt the base of Painter's Cliff to cross Elder Branch and mount the hill beyond, and Gorey would have to face the squandered home of his father's. Every rock he passed, every tree, every foot of the rocky way was familiar to him. Though he had forgotten the woods, they thrilled him like the music of Home Sweet Home. They rounded the cliff, descended into Elder Branch, and paused there to let the horses drink and splash in the swift water. On the right, 
was a rail fence that cornered there and followed the road and stream. Enclosed by it was the old apple orchard of the home place. The house was yet concealed by the brow of the steep hill. Inside and along the fence, pokeberries, elders, sassafras, and sumac grew high and dense. At a rustle of their branches, both Gory and Coltrane glanced up and saw a long, yellow, wolfish face above the fence, staring at them with pale, unwinking eyes. The head quickly disappeared. There was a violent swaying of the bushes, and an ungainly figure ran up through the apple orchard in the direction of the house zigzagging among the trees. "'That's Garvey,' said Coltrane, "'the man you sold out to. "'There's no doubt, but he's considerably cracked. "'I had to send him up for moonshining once, "'several years ago, in spite of the fact "'that I believed him irresponsible. "'Why, what's the matter, Yancey?' "'Gory was wiping his forehead, "'and his face had lost its color. "'Do I look queer, too?' he asked, trying to smile. "'I'm just remembering a few more things.' Some of the alcohol had evaporated from his brain. I recollect now where I got that two hundred dollars. Don't think of it, said Coltrane cheerfully. Later on, we'll figure it all out together. They rode out of the branch, and when they reached the foot of the hill, Gorey stopped again. Did you ever suspect that I was a very vain kind of fellow, Colonel? he asked. Sort of foolish proud about appearances. The Colonel's eyes refused to wander to the soiled, sagging suit of flax and the faded slouch hat. It seems to me, he replied, mystified, but humoring him, I remember a young buck about twenty, with the tightest coat, the sleekest hair, and the prancingest saddle horse in the Blue Ridge. Right you are, said Gorey eagerly, and it's in me yet, though it don't show. Oh, I'm as vain as a turkey gobbler, and as proud as Lucifer. I'm going to ask you to indulge this weakness of mine in a little matter. Speak out, Yancey. We'll create you Duke of Laurel and Baron of Blue Ridge, if you choose, and you shall have a feather out of Stella's peacock's tail to wear in your hat. I'm in earnest. In a few minutes we'll pass the house up there on the hill where I was born, and where my people have lived for nearly a century. Strangers live there now, and look at me. I'm about to show myself to them, ragged and poverty-stricken, a rastal and beggar. Colonel Coltrane, I'm ashamed to do it. I want you to let me wear your coat and hat until we are out of sight beyond. I know you think it is a foolish pride, but I want to make as good a showing as I can when I pass the old place. Now, what does this mean? said Coltrane to himself, as he compared his companion's sane looks and quiet demeanor with his strange request. But he was already unbuttoning the coat, assenting readily, as if the fancy were in no wise to be considered strange. The coat and hat fitted Gorey well. He buttoned the former about him with a look of satisfaction and dignity. He and Coltrane were nearly the same size, rather tall, portly, and erect. Twenty-five years were between them, but in appearance they might have been brothers. Gorey looked older than his age. His face was puffy and lined. The colonel had the smooth, fresh complexion of a temperate liver. He put on Gorey's disreputable old flax coat and faded slouch hat. Now, said Gorey, taking up the reins, I'm all right. I want you to ride about ten feet in the rear as we go by, Colonel, so that they can get a good look at me. They'll see I'm no back number yet by any means. I guess I'll show up pretty well to them once more. Anyhow, let's ride on. He set out up the hill at a smart trot, the colonel following, as he had been requested. Gorey sat straight in the saddle, with head erect, but his eyes were turned to the right, sharply scanning every shrub and fence and hiding place in the old homestead yard. Once he muttered to himself, Will the crazy fool try it, or did I dream half of it? It was when he came opposite the little family burying ground that he saw what he had been looking for a puff of white smoke coming from the thick cedars in one corner. He toppled so slowly to the left that Coltrane had time to urge his horse to that side and catch him with one arm. The squirrel hunter had not overpraised his aim. He had sent the bullet where he intended, and where Gorey had expected that it would pass, through the breast of Colonel Abner Coltrane's black frock coat. 
Gorey leaned heavily against Coltrane, but he did not fall. The horses kept pace side by side, and the colonel's arms kept him steady. The little white houses of Laurel shone through the trees half a mile away. Gorey reached out one hand and groped until it rested upon Coltrane's fingers, which held his bridle. Good friend, he said, and that was all. Thus did Yancey Gorey, as he rode past his old home, make considering all things, the best showing that was in his power. End of section 15